Hello, welcome to chapter four, managing money. Let's not mess this up. Oh, oh, unit 4A, taking control of your finances. Interesting that I'm recording this particular unit this particular day, as the advice is much needed for me as well. Here we go. Let's look at how to control your financing, uh, finances. First of all, you have to know your bank balance. Uh, you could get that texted to you every day, you have apps, you have no reason not to know how much money you have. Avoid bouncing a check. If you've ever seen one, you know how to write one or you even have checks available. And, and you don't want your debit card rejected, right? That's the worst thing that can happen. Embarrassing and you don't get your stuff. Know what you spend. In particular, keep track of debit and credit card spending. Give yourself one month, carry a notebook, Write down every time you spend anything, right? You walk by the, the, get a soda, right? When you're on campus in the machine, write that down. Write down when you, you gave two bucks to the, a tip because wherever you were, write everything down. Everything you spend for a month. And I bet you're going to have some like, wow, moments in your life. Try never to buy on impulse. Always think first. Buy only if the purchase makes sense. Um, I've started asking, okay, where are we going to put that? When are we going to use it? Was it for? And we've stopped a lot of our purchases just on those. And I highly recommend you make a budget and don't overspend it. Let's take a look at credit card spending. Cassidy has begun keeping her spending under better control, but she still can't fully pay off her credit card balance. She maintains an average monthly balance of about $1,100, and her card charges a 24% annual interest rate which it bills at a rate of 2% per month. How much is she spending on credit card interest? Well, her average monthly interest is 2% of the $1,100 average balance. 2% written in decimal form, because we always do math with decimals. We write about percentages, but we do the arithmetic with decimals. 0.02 times 1100, excuse me, is $22. But that's an average monthly interest if we multiply that month, monthly interest of $22 by the 12 months in a year, she's paying $264 a year in interest. Interest alone is costing her $260, a significant amount for someone living on a tight budget, like a college student or professor. Clearly, she'd be a lot better off if she could find a way to pay off that credit card balance and end the interest payment. It's, it's the interest that kills you, right? If you can't afford it, don't buy it. Don't put the payment off till later. So a four-step budget making process, and this will be one of the projects that you could do at the end of the semester. Um, we have a project for each chapter uh, as a, a closer assignment, our quote final exam. List all monthly income. Be sure to include, uh, uh, that applies to fall of 2023 only. I just realized this is a recording that will be used in future semesters, so future semesters, you don't have to hold me to that. First step in a four-step budget-making process, list all monthly income. Be sure to include an average monthly amount for any income you do not receive monthly, such as scholarships, right? You only receive those maybe twice a year. Determine your average monthly expenses. Be sure to include an average amount for expenses that don't recur monthly, such as expenses for tuition, books, vacation, insurance, holiday gifts, car registration, all of that stuff that isn't all the time. Um, but it comes up throughout the year. Number three, determine your net monthly cash flow by subtracting your total expenses from your total income, right? Your total income should be the bigger number. Subtract your expenses, that's how much money you have left over. Now, if your expenses are more than your income, you're definitely want to get, going to want to do number four and make adjustments as needed. All right, so let's look at another example. Let's look at college expenses. In addition to your monthly expenses, you have the following college expenses that you pay twice a year. $3,500 for tuition each semester, $750 in student fees each semester, and $800 for textbooks each semester. How should you handle these expenses in computing your monthly budget? Well, let's look at the amount paid over a whole year. Twice a year, we'll pay tuition, fees, and books. So we'll add up this money that we pay, We'll multiply it by two. We're spending $10,000, $10,100 on school, but only twice a year. So we take that $10,100 
And to average this total expense for the year, we divide by 12, put it on a monthly basis. So about $842 a month will give you $10,100. So even though this $10,100 only occurs twice a year, you could budget for it, right? Your average monthly college expenses for tuition, fees, and textbooks comes to a little less than 850. So put 850 per month into your expense list and you'll be able to save up for that and have your tuition dollars and not have to make pay payment plans afterwards. You could have it all paid for ahead of time. Let's look at the cost of a college class. Right? Everybody says go to college, go to college, go to college. You're currently in college, so you obviously listen to that advice. Um, but is it always the right thing to do? All right, let's look. Across all institutions, the average cost of a three credit college cr class is approximately $1,500. Suppose that between class time, commute time, and study time, the average class requires about 10 hours per week of your time. Assuming that you could have had a job paying $10 per hour, what is the net cost of the class compared to working? Is it a worthwhile expense? All right. Now, a typical college class, uh, semester lasts 14 weeks. Ours per lasts 15. No, nope. ours lasts 16. Uh, that, that school up down the street on I-10, they're 15. Some are 14. Whatever. We're going to use 14-week semester for this example. So your lost work wages for the time you spend on the class, right, those 14 weeks, for 10 hours per week you're working on this class, and that's not 10, that should be a 15, uh, that, that should be $10. How much were we making? We were making 10. If I change this to a 15, then I can leave the 15 here. All right, so this money, this is the amount of money that you would have made had you been working those 10 hours for, uh, per week over those 14 weeks, right? It's how much you would have made. But we find the total net cost of taking in class by adding this to the $1,500 that the class itself costs. The result is $2,900. Now, you're paying out $2,900 essentially, right? You're losing $2,100 in income during the time that you're spent studying and being in class and doing all that, and you had to pay for the class, so you're down $3,000 for this one class. The thing is, whether it's worthwhile or not is totally dependent on you. But remember, over, the, over your career, which unfortunately these days, you know, you're going to be working about 40 years, if not more, you'll earn a million more over the career um, by having a, a college degree than just a high school graduate. And so I swear it's worth it. It just doesn't look like it until uh, later in life. That's a lot like interest, which we'll talk about soon. Let's look at insurance costs. Premiums are the amount you pay to purchase the policy. A deductible is the amount you're personally responsible for before the insurance company helps you at all. Like, yay, I have insurance. Oh, I have to pay a certain amount of money before the insurance even thinks about looking at it. Right? And a co-payment usually applies to health insurance specifically and is the amount you pay each time you use a particular service that's covered. All right? So they get you every way possible. Let's look at an emergency room visit. And uh, we're in the U.S., so we have, to pay. we have to pay. Suppose you have an accident and ended up in the emergency room receiving a $7,000 bill for your treatment. Fortunately, you have health insurance, but your policy has a $1,000 annual deductible a $250 co-payment for emergency room visits, and after that, pays only 80% of the remaining balance. Yay, insurance. How much will you pay out of pocket for the emergency room visit? Assume that you haven't had any other medical expenses in the current year. As we break this down, we see that our total payment has three parts. First of all, we have to pay the $1,000 deductible which we'll pay in full because we haven't paid out anything yet this year. So we have to pay the $1,000. Go to the ER, it doesn't matter. You have insurance, insurance says every time you go to the ER, you must pay the ER $250. All right, they haven't even talked to you yet and you're out $1,250. Now, you also share the remainder of the balance. 
the total bill is seven thousand, but you've already paid twelve fifty, right? The deductible plus the copayment. Therefore, the remaining balance is that seven thousand dollars minus twelve fifty, which is five thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars. The insurance company pays eighty percent of this, and this is why we get insurance because they they do help out. So you owe the other twenty percent. Twenty percent in decimal form is point two times that $5,750 that remains, that's $1,150. Your total out-of-pocket expense is the deductible plus the copay plus the 20% of the remaining bill. You'll pay $2,400 of the $7,000 bill. Um, I guess it saves you $4,600 and, and that's pretty awesome. But uh, Frustrating, frustrating that we have to pay so much. Okay, let's do some base financial goals on some solid understanding. First way, find a way to make your budget allow for savings. Understand how savings work and how to choose an appropriate savings plan. We're going to talk about that coming up in this unit. You need to understand the basic mathematics of loans. Definitely going to hit that in this unit. You need to understand how taxes are computed and how they can affect your financial decisions. Sometimes it's better to buy a couple of major products in one year rather than spreading them out each year. Um, we're going to talk about that a little bit and we're also going to talk about how the federal budget affects your future personal finances. Unfortunately, we do have to pay attention to the government because uh, the older you get, the more you realize that they really are in control of your paycheck. Alright, that's it for this particular lecture. I will be posting the next one soon. Thanks for listening.